have if you guys would follow me up front, or do we want to stand right here and do a little Q&A? Let's, let's jump up front. Let's do it. Woo! Suave. Rico. Suave. Rico. Suave. Rico. Suave. Rico. Suave. 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 Suave.
¿Ustedes son ricos, padre? Yeah. Oh, suavecito. Canelito, suavecito. Ahí uh -huh. ¿verdad? Rico. Suave. That's all that's left. But I was going to tell you about the, about the movie. Um, I get calls like crazy because it does come on TV. I mean, more than any other movie or anything that I've that ever done. So I see a lot of, and uh, my kids see a lot and you know, people call me and they always call me, dude, that mullet. Is that for real? <laughs> so it's uh, yeah. I love it when you're when you're when you're eating the food in the room where you're always tasting. You're always doing shit with excuse my language, but you're always doing stuff with your you're like lady and you're always I mean, like, always <laughs> no, you're always doing something. And something that's real. No, you're totally paying attention to what you're actually doing and it's so weird though what you were actually doing. <laughs> and also Gerard was the first High school student in history never had to wear a shirt. For high school, every single shirtless in high school. Oh, yeah, shirtless. That shirt got on smaller. It kept shrinking. That shirt. You didn't have a shirt on. What do you mean? I like to have a sweatshirt, but I was calm. Yeah, I never saw that anywhere else. You know what? I I, I don't know why. I mean, I, I was a skinny twig back then. I I I guess I thought I was muscular back then. <laughs> I actually think that I, the director, he's not here tonight, Steve Rash did a great job oh, yeah. in this movie. He's Is Chris director. Rash still here? That's the director's son, Chris, Chris Rash. Rash. Oh, really? I wanted to ask you guys about the lines, the, the one-liners, uh, the, the iconic ones that stuck with me. Um, obviously, they stuck with you guys. Uh, has there ever been weird times in your life when this film has found you? Michael told me a story about being where when you saw a copy of this film. You were like in a third world country somewhere in a video uh, store. I was in Bruges in Belgium, which is a walled city <laughs> built in 1300. And we're walking through Bruges and there's a little video store. You know, blockbusters have 20,000 videos in the store. This had maybe 1,200. And just for the hell of it, I know it sounds pretty bad. I'm <laughs> Belgian looking for my movie. But there it was. It was Camp Love Me Love in French. And, hmm. In a medieval city that was built 1,300 years. It was really weird. That's somebody else though. <laughs> I, I was doing a TV series in Mexico, and um, we were all having dinner at this restaurant. And on the TV in the corner, um, I had my back to it, and some of the cast members and people I was working with said, Look, there you are, speaking the best Spanish you've ever spoken in your life! <laughs> but it was Can't Buy Me Love. Awesome. <laughs> um, Any other questions? <laughs> yeah, do we want to take questions? I mean, I have questions, but you guys probably have questions. I see Darcy. I'm not see Darcy all the time. I've seen Max. Max I used to see a lot. I love Claire. Yeah, I love Max. <laughs> um, but I haven't seen Eric or Gerard on over 20 years. Yeah, it's right. yeah. I see Michael a lot. Yeah. I, I see Darcy. I see uh, Court. I love. Uh, uh, Court. I see Court and Darcy together sometimes. But I uh, I see Courtney alone. <laughs> <laughs> and Courtney and I live. Courtney, you hang out with Patrick. Um, well, yeah, we worked together on Sweet Home Alabama, so, yeah. yeah. And I said to him then, I said, hey, you know, you, me, another movie with a title thing, you know, title song, you know you're going to blow up again, right? <laughs> Guess I was right, so. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what's weird is I had actually done, and I don't think many people know this, but I had done a day on a film previous, I don't know, did Woo Wise Harbor or the, the character that he did where he played a runaway, did that come out before or after? No, it, actually, we shot our, they shot their movie first. Okay, so and then they saw they saw that Disney picked up distribution on our movie, and then they waited, so trying to build on the popularity. Of that's they shot the movie, first, but released after us. In the mood, is that right? Yeah. Okay, so I had gotten a call to do a day on this film, and I didn't remember, and, and, and it was with Patrick, and so I do a cameo in the scene with Patrick um, in that in, in the mood, and then I just so we shot. Did you say we shot? Previous we shot after them. And then so then I went to work with it and totally forgot that I had done a one liner with it. <laughs> totally. Tried to negotiate with Marissa Tomei to play the late 
Um, we did casting in New York, and Marissa Tomei was just completely unknown then, but she blew us away. And we couldn't work out a deal, and she had other stuff going on. So she was the first choice for Cindy Mancini. Um, for Ronald Miller, we actually uh, had a contract. He never signed it, thank God. But we had a contract with a great actor named Mark Price. Uh, do you remember the show with Michael Keaton, Family Ties? He was Skippy. Remember Skippy? We, Skippy was going to be uh, Ronald Miller. And literally, we, we, we offered him, I think we offered whatever we offered him, $35,000. And it was, he wanted more, we wanted to pay less. And this thing went on for a couple days. And I got a call randomly from um, Wayne Rice, who's since written Suicide Kings and produced Valentine's Day, all these great movies. Uh, Wayne was at Lorimar at the time, and he called me up. And we were just friends. We played basketball together. And he called me up and he said, there's an actor on the lot that nobody knows about doing the woo-woo kid named yeah. Patrick Dempsey. Yeah. Well, I said, we already hired him. He was great, right? that too. He was great. And, uh, he, and he said, well, we haven't closed the contract. So Patrick came in the next day, and he completely blew us away. But we were worried that Skippy was going to sign the contract, and we were bound to him, but he didn't. Uh, and we signed Patrick to do the movie. And um, I remember the, the big scene for chemistry was Court and Patrick read together. And before you guys read together, you were just standing there waiting to start reading. And Court turned to Patrick and he went, boom, like that. And Patrick fell backwards. And we said, okay, there's our combination. There's the badass. And there's remember, the guy. I remember the casting session. I remember the casting session. There was like, I had not done, I'd done, I think, Teen Wolf the, before I did Can't Find Me Love. <laughs> what, what a fucking joke that was. Um, but I remember there was like, there was the first casting session I think where there was like so many people in the room. And there was like a scene where I have to grab Courtney in a, in a, at the end scene where I grab him and I pull him up and I do this. And, uh, and I didn't know what to do. I was like 20, 20 years old. And, and, uh, and I remember I just grabbed the first guy that was there and I picked him up and I was like threatening the shit out of him. And then I realized afterwards it was Rash, it was the director. And I picked him up and I screamed at him, like, whatever. And I walked out and I called me, and like, I'll never get this fucking part. There's no way this is going to happen. I thought, and then you guys uh, were nice. So. <laughs> we're nice. What do you guys remember about shooting this film? About the experience of when you weren't shooting? We had a lot of fun together. <laughs> do you have any, uh, anything that, that you were thinking of? Like, when you watched this film, what was going through your head? Like, were you flashing back to the experience, or is it kind of a hazy experience? Oh, no, it's not, um, smoked a lot of pot. <laughs> we smoked a lot of pot. I remember that. <laughs> I remember. But it was also, you got to realize, we were in Tucson, and it snowed. Yeah. First time in, like, 18 years ever snowed yeah. in Tucson. We had snowball fights out on the front. We were in this really Ganky hotel. Oh, it was the best place in town. What was it like? The best place in town. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it was on Hooker Row. <laughs> so there's like that was all that was strip 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 It was called Miracle Mile or Strip Club oh, Row. So it was like all the strip clubs, right, like right down. And we'd all go. I think whoever was of age, there's a few of us who were like, Mark Burke. Burke. yeah. Oh, sorry, Mark Burke didn't take us, but we would yeah. go to strip clubs. <laughs> Steve Rash took us. Yeah, well, we'd go to strip clubs. I was only 15, so you had you had my eight track player in your room with all your ladies back then. You, know, you were Rico Suave then. <laughs> I, I remember something that was was kind of a weird tidbit, but um, I remember I had to take my skateboard. Well, I pretty much took my skateboard everywhere at that age. Well, I still do, but I had um, I just had I guess got the the eye of one of the, the younger. The, Kids, yeah. it says, Seth, who played, uh, who played uh, Chucky, and he was so, I was taken with him, like his energy was just so unbridled, mm -hmm. and um, he, uh, he wanted to learn how to skateboard, so I taught him some, a few tricks, and he always, he wrote me a letter <laughs> saying, saying thank you for, and his dad, I remember his dad was so instrumental in, in spending so much time and giving him so much love, and I thought that I would have liked to have had a, a, a dad uh, see me through what, you know, uh, that went on the film sets, uh, you know, it was just cool to see. And Barbara, his, his mother, mom. was there all the time, yeah. too. I remember, yeah. I remember when he, we I were sitting, like when we did. Because <laughs> 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 I, I, I remember we did the first set of shooting, and then Disney bought it. Mm -hmm. 
And then we went back we went to Tucson, back. we reshot a bunch of stuff. Yeah. And I think it was when he was like, was a whole bunch of us were sitting in a trailer one day, and Seth had written this letter to Woody Allen. And he was telling all us, because he got radio, radio days. Yeah. He did radio yeah. days right after that. And he had written this long letter about that. And I think because you did colors. You guys did colors right after that. We did, we did, yeah. we did three movies in a row. We did three movies in a row. That's this, is like, this is a little cool trivia for you. Courtney and I, before Camp Bobby Love, we were in a movie called Winners Take All. Motorcycle. Which you probably haven't seen. Losers. Yeah. And then, and then uh, we, watched, we did Camp Bobby Love. And then after that, we were both reading a script while we are doing Camp Bobby Love, which was Colors. Yeah, no, I remember, well, you got the script, and you, and he knew that I grew up, you know, in tough neighborhoods in L.A., and, you know, he said, dude, there's a white gangbanger in colors, you've got to get on this, and so, that's how we got, how we got Camp I Below, since we did this other movie for that Apollo company, and they, they liked us. Echo Park, Holmes. <laughs> and yeah. you and I did Hard Bodies together. That's right, the hard one, for that. That'll so. be next uh, Friday Night Midnight Hard Bodies. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> So should I give a little history of what uh, what happened with the, how the movie got set up and just sure. yeah. and we'll uh, um, You know, when I, when I wrote it, I, I wrote it and I finished it, and then I just put it on my shelf. And I, by the way, it was Carson. Are you here? Yeah. Okay, I wrote it on a thing called a typewriter, <laughs> and I've never heard of that. But I wrote it on a thing called the type. That's how long ago this? So I wrote it in '85 or '86, '85, I think. And uh, and I. We started writing and I, again, I was in the mail room and I just put it on my shelf and I just didn't even try to sell it. And then after playing basketball one day, guys came over to my house and another assistant to an agent said, oh, where's that script? And he read it and he said, hey, this is pretty good. Maybe you could sell it. And uh, um, Mark Berg, I wish you were here. Mark Berg was really instrumental with that. But we, uh, originally I sold it to TriStar, which used to be part of Columbia. It's, uh, it's no longer in existence, but it, it got fold it into um, Sony. Yeah, and um, and TriStar uh, with, with Tom Mountain, Mark Berg, and I went in for the first notes meeting. And I was really psyched, because the first script I wrote, I sold it to a major company, I actually made some money, it was like a great thing. And then uh, I come into the first meeting at TriStar, and like the six executives are sitting there. And I've never met studio executives before, because I'm not really a writer, and uh, yet, so, and there's one woman sitting there, and like killjoy, you know, typical executive, you know, with the glasses and all uptight and all that. And she's like, "Well, I don't know why we bought this movie because it's like, it's like almost prostitution, the way they treat this girl." And guess what? Try to start putting it in turnaround. They paid a lot of money for it. I was barely through the first rewrite, and I get a call: "Your career's over. You're no longer a writer. Your script has been dropped by TriStar." So my agent had gotten a call from Jerry Henshaw at Apollo, and he said, "We're looking." for a guy to rewrite a motocross movie. <laughs> My agent sent over Boy Rents Girl as a writing sample to get me the, the rewrite gig on uh, the motocross movie. Jerry Henshaw, God bless him, no longer with us. Right. Jerry Henshaw had about an eight or $10 million fund that he got from Wall Street to make movies. And uh, he read Boy Rents Girl and he said, forget the motocross movie, I want to make this. And I met with Jerry Henshaw in October and he said to me, we will be rolling camera, we'll be, we'll be shooting uh, in January. And I didn't believe him, because I thought movies always took years to make. And uh, Jerry made it for one point, we made it for $1.8 million. We shot it, we had no distributor. So we could finish this movie, and you know, first time writer, you know, we pulled it off somehow. Uh, Patrick, a newcomer, and now the, the, uh, the film is done, and we have no distributor. But we got fortunate once again. It, like, everything smiled on this movie. During the movie, Mark Berg had a friend come visit him named Chris Zarkas. He came to the set. He was unemployed. Couldn't get a job. He, he got fired from a job. He came out, spent a week with us. In the scene where uh, she's buying the outfit, there's a kind of background, trying on clothes. That's Chris. He's like, oh, let me be in the movie. Um, and Chris partied with us. He hung out. He drank with us. He partied. We had a great time. Chris comes back to L.A. Chris gets a job in L.A. He gets a job at Disney, and it's, they started a new division at Disney. It's called Acquisitions. Chris Zarkis gets hired as head of Acquisitions for Disney. We finish our movie two weeks after he gets his job. We show the movie to Chris Zarkis. And Chris Zarkis goes to his two bosses at the time. You might have heard of these two gentlemen. 
Michael Eisner and Jeffrey Katzenberg. And he went to Eisner and Katzenberg and he said, um, I've got this movie, it's low budget, they made it for nothing, it's a good story, it seems to work, all that kind of stuff. So they were going to screen it for Katzenberg and Eisner. Turns out, my parents were in town visiting and my brother had uh, tore his knee up playing basketball, he had ACL, so he's on crutches. So I said, I want to show the movie to my parents and my brother. My parents are here for a week, they want to see. So Disney figured they'd save some money, so they screened it for me, my parents, and my brother. And then I find out two minutes before the screening, it's the screening for Eisner and Katzenberg. <laughs> okay, there's ten seats in there. And I said to my parents, I go, don't say anything dumb. <laughs> I told my brother, don't say, oh, I love your movies, I'm a good kid. Don't say, I go, you're going to see a very tall guy walk in and a short guy walk in. And what Steve Rash and Mark Berg and Tom Mount had always said to me, uh, if people laugh in the first two, three minutes, you know, we'll, we'll get a sale. So it's dark. Thank God that my parents couldn't talk to them. They sit down right in front of us, and I'm like nervous. I don't want to belch. I don't want to have gas. Nothing. I mean, these are like the kings of Hollywood that are sitting right here. They walk in. They sit down. They laugh three or four times in the first three, four minutes, and they get up and walk out. That day, they bought the film for $6 million. Wow. We made it for one point. And Disney was the first outside acquisition in the history of the uh, of the Walt Disney Company. Now they acquire all their acquisitions is a huge part of the business, but it was just starting back then. Wow. Little history. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Eric, talk. Okay. Oh, okay, I'll talk. Hey, uh, thanks for coming out. Um, I just remember I was just thinking about the movie. How much I don't really talk to. I haven't talked to many of these people lately, but I just remember how much fun we had on that movie. That's right. It sounds corny, but it was just, I wasn't aware of, obviously, my acting. <laughs> well, I took now, I'm like, so you overact a little bit. Um, <laughs> I just remember, we just had such a good time, you know what That's I mean? Right. And I remember, like, I'd hang out with Gerardo, and he'd have, like, all his black leather clothes on. <laughs> and I, like, I had OP shorts on, and, like, OP shirt. And it still got along totally well. Right. Then I'm going to out Gerardo, I'm going to make him feel bad now. But I remember, uh, you did Rico Suave and all that stuff? Yeah. Bro, you yeah, used to be a killer break dancer. You used to come to my high school. He was the dude, baddest break out. dancer, dude. Oh, yeah. so, oh, stays up stage. Oh, wait. <laughs> hey, you, you know that scene that Patrick does that little thing? Yeah. That was, I was trying to teach the guy to do some moves. So that was him really trying. He wasn't messing around. <laughs> also, Paula Abdul choreographed That's everything. Right. I remember she could not get us to be serious. She's like, come on, there's serious stuff. And we're like, no, screwing around. <laughs> No, but then Gerardo did his Rico Suave thing, and then I was, we were really tight, and then I saw you in Vegas, man, and you had your entourage, and you were kind of a dick. <laughs> uh, he told that to everybody, too. Hey, he came back, and he told every one of us, too. He's like, yeah, I saw the Vegas, he was an asshole. He went Hollywood. And I was like, Gerardo? You know what? Oh, he's what? Rico Suave now? Yeah, he's back, though, now. He's a good guy again. <laughs> I used to see him at my high school, and he used to break dance and be, he had so many, all different kind of chicks. <laughs> I mean, break dancing was, wasn't the thing, though. It was, it was him. It wasn't me. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, listen, even, I, I can, I don't remember that time, but I can imagine, because, you know, there was a time where, I, uh, that's another story. But I'm a pastor now. So if you guys want to come to church anytime, my church over there in uh, Orange County, on the bike. I've been. I've been. I've been. And he's Jewish. He's been. <laughs> and I'm still Jewish. That's right. <laughs> um, do we guys have any questions? Uh, people want to ask questions right up here. I just wanted to, uh, to the writer, um, uh, if you saw Easy A, that movie was highly influenced by this Big film. Time. And yeah. it gives major props to it. Yeah. How would you guys feel about that being one of the best films of 2010? Well, Chris over here has been telling me for months to... Netflix, Watch it. easy, I, and it is on my next Netflix queue, but it's like 30 down. Final, final shot. I'm going through Hitchcock for like the next two months, then I'm going to get, yeah, I, I, I yeah. Um, you had no idea though. You didn't know until I had told you. That right. No, but I, now I'm starting to hear about Easy A, and I think they, it's like an homage kind of? Yeah. Oh yeah, and, and It doesn't put it down, does it? will be an end on the channel. No, no. Yeah. Right. Uh, you're like, in 2000, maybe, uh, I ended up at a dinner thing with uh, all the people that were the director, writer, 
of uh, she's gonna have it. She's, she's all, all that. that. She's all that. She's all that. And you know, I'm just minding my own business. And the person I'm with says, "Oh, he wrote Can't Find Me Love," and they were really honest. They said, "Dude, we ripped you off as much as we possibly could. <laughs> <laughs> Thank yes. you so much." <laughs> Saw a hand back there. You? I want to ask about uh, love don't cost a thing. Let's <laughs> <laughs> question for Mark. Oh Mark, are you here? Seriously, Mark, come on. Um, Mark, Mark Berg, who uh, really was instrumental in, the, in this. He, he helped. He he was instrumental because he put the script in Tom Mount's uh, suitcase when Tom went to Hawaii. Because Tom was the guy who set this movie up. He was, used to be president of Universal. He, he supervised, as president of Universal, a little movie called Animal House. And, um, and so Mark got Tom to read it. And uh, Mark, since then, has done quite well. He owns a movie franchise called Saw. And he's done quite well. He's also executive producer. None of us have been in it, any of no, us. <laughs> uh, but Mark, Mark called me a few years ago, and he said, let's do an African-American version of this. And Mark here, we not. did... Um, Mark's not here? Yeah, he's I personally think he takes himself a little too seriously. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Dude, you'll never be in Saw 12. It will not happen. <laughs> I respect that, man. You will not, but uh, I, honestly, uh, I worked on that movie, too. Uh, it didn't have the heart. It was kind of mean-spirited compared to this. And, um, it wasn't quite what this was, I thought. Yeah. Oh. Uh, Looking through the songwriting credits, I noticed that one of the songs in the movie is claimed to be written by Chuck Lorre. Is that the same Chuck Lorre who created Two and a Half Men? Yes, Chuck Lorre was a musician uh, back in the day. He's obviously a really talented guy. He created Big Bang Theory, Dharma and Greg, and Two and a Half Men. He's very poor. He has no money, this guy. Oh, yeah. Well, you guys are all wonderful. I think it's amazing that you did it on low budget because Working in casting, I know that Patrick and Amanda never would have gotten cast in a movie like this, being as unknown as they were. Um, my friend had never seen it before, and one of the first things he said was, she's amazing. So I was wondering what that was like for you to cast somebody, what the casting experience was after Marissa Tomei was able to do it. How did you guys find Amanda Peterson? And I, I, Let me say something yeah. Does anybody know how old Amanda was? No. Yeah, yeah, she's 15. 15. 15. Yeah. Damn, I'm a joke. 15. I tell all the guys that, oh, man, you work with her? And she's 15. Both here. the girls were 15. <laughs> we were warned heavily. She was the day I went to the court. What? Court. It was in uh, you know, Tucson, Arizona, tough state, yeah. bars, prisons. It's like being in another country. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, you know, I'm, I'm, a lot of people came in and read for this. Um, Uma Thurman read for this, Faith Ford read for this, um, uh, great actresses read for this, but Amanda walked in and it just, you know, it was uh, Steve Rash, um, Jerry Henshaw, Mark Berg, myself, she just walked in and like, we all sort of look at each other and um, we just knew, you know, right then and there. Darcy, I had seen Darcy's work before and uh, I was a fan of Darcy, I actually, Called her agent up personally. I said, "Would Darcy be in this movie?" I David Wilder. Yeah. I David called David. David. Um, and then all these other these other guys. I mean, we wanted. Of course, is it Carol Jones? Is that was it? Carol, Carol Jones Carol and her Jack. son Jack. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll never in my life forget that experience of going into that office. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty casting office. I actually I actually read for a movie with Carol Jones like a year after that, and this is my favorite story of any casting session. She. She farted in the, in the audition, and it was so bad that it was like her son Jack is working the camera, and her son Jack like looks at me like, oh, oh, oh. Like, yeah, I'm standing up going, this is uncomfortable, man. I can't fucking breathe. You know? And I kind of had to just go on, and like, there was like this green elephant in the room, and no one would say anything. Her son would say anything. Her son was like, wasn't he like a little retarded? Or, I mean, he was like a little weird guy, but you know, dude, what did she do? Huh? She just stood there. She just kept reading. I'm going, dude, this was like shit in here. You know? <laughs> I forget that. Did you gave her Carol Jones. I didn't get the fucking job. No, I didn't. Oh, I have something to say. Um, when I met the, um, when I got the, the job, I, um, I, I went, we went to the um, table reading, and I met the two girls. And because I was in my 20s, and uh, <clears throat> that's 
what I said at the time, oh, I'm going to meet these girls, become best friends with them, and do that method acting thing. <laughs> and um, I met the girls, they were 15 years old. <laughs> so I was like, hmm, so you guys want to go to the movies? We don't drive yet, can you pick us up? <laughs> so <laughs> that was kind of interesting. And um, when, I, when we went to Tucson, I uh, had asked to be put back into the high school. So I got there like three days early, I don't know if you remember this or not, to do my research to go back to school. They and put us in. Did they enroll us? I, I got, yeah, I was. I got busted. You got, you got busted? In, uh, in drama. Uh, I got loud. What happened? What were you? <laughs> I just went back to school. But did really did you guys enroll us? You enrolled us all at that school. No. I totally got asked them to. Really? I, 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 I asked to do it personally. I don't know what I he's talking about. No, I didn't. <laughs> did you ask? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. How old were you? You, you were younger. How do you know? Hey, uh, four star. Anything else? Uh, yes. Okay, was well, that tanning beds or liquid tanner? Because so it was the sunshine because it was it was hot down there. We were all hanging out by the pool. Because I was looking at the film too going, wow, we all look really tan. Well, we were in Arizona and uh, we were hanging out by the pool and sunning and, and then the snow came. Right, that sounds like 18, 20 yeah. years, right? I don't know if you notice in the scene where the cheerleaders are practicing and Ronnie Miller's looking. If you look real closely in the background, you'll see picketers. We were being picketed because we were not right. union. And the, the picketers were there every day. They became our friends. Well, I, I actually was picketing with them. <laughs> and they would bring us food and all that. But we, we were, uh, we, you know, I'm from New Jersey, so it, it was written for New Jersey because that's what I know in my head. And there's lawns in New Jersey, and I used to have a, like a rider mower, a Toro. So it's all sort of, you know, there's lawns. We got we show up in Tucson, and we realize nobody has a lawn in Tucson. If you look really closely at the movie, the only lawn in the whole town is Cindy Mancini's. We planted that lawn. We we planted it. Okay, now the movie's over. The lawn dies. We go back to do reshoots because we went back. We didn't have close-ups like the scene where. She's rubbing the thing out of the, uh, the stain. Mm -hmm. We didn't have time to shoot that. It was a low-budget movie. So Disney said, go back and get us close-ups for this scene, close-ups for that scene. And we, we shot the, uh, the Cindy Mancini, the lawnmower, Patrick, you know, she pays him and they ride off in the sunset. We show, we show up back in Tucson four months later, there's no grass. <laughs> $15,000 to re the lawn for one day of shooting. Oh, my goodness. That was worth it, though. It was, it was worth it, yeah. And the most expensive thing in the movie was not the director, the actors. Uh, the song was the most expensive thing in the movie. The song cost $125,000. And uh, let's see if people know trivia. Uh, who's the man who gave us the rights to the song? We had to show it to him in his house. The movie was taken up to uh, Neverland. And uh, it was shown to Michael Jackson, and he loved the movie, and, um, and he gave it to us for the bargain price of $125,000. <laughs> with all kinds of conditions on it. Like, it could only be like 18 seconds in a commercial, a certain amount of seconds in a TV commercial. There's, when you buy a song, there's a lot of stipulations on, on how much you can use it. So, I know more information than you'll ever need in your life. Actually, I just did, it, did, did that, and I had it done. Want to know the, it was um, 50, it was 150. If you do it under a festival, like if you do a short film, I had a James Brown song that I really wanted to use, and everyone was like, "Nah, you'll never get it." But it, if you do it for festival licensing, it's like 150 bucks a song. Wow. We didn't, uh, you know, Eisner and Casper couldn't figure that they out. Didn't have the festivals. <laughs> yeah, those guys they just couldn't be successful with that. Anyway, so, so. I love the score. I love the score too, especially like that main theme. Robert Folk. Is he here, Robert Folk? Are you here? Yeah, I emailed him. Yeah, in the back. He said hi. Yes. Was it, was it only after you got the rights to the song that you changed the name of the movie? Uh, the, the, the movie title was changed by Michael Eisner himself. It was called, when I had it, uh, the first title I had, the first time I wrote it was called The Payoff. And then I switched it to Boy Rents Girl. They thought Boy Rents Girl in 1987 was too salacious. So <laughs> Eisner, brilliant guy that he is, he said, can't find me love. And then they went after the song. After they, after he came up with the title. Cool. Is there any more questions? Anyone have a question? I'll give you one last funny story. I know you all want to go home. Okay, I never saw the movie before and I've been in a room with these people. But my first meeting at Disney with David Hoberman, who's done quite well since then, 
Cardo Mestris, uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg, all the people, uh, Steve Rash, Jerry Henshaw, um, you know, I'd show up at this meeting at the Disney lot, and there's a guard at the gate, and I have a drive on. This was all kind of new to me. And I go to this meeting, and I'm sort of a fly on the wall, and I'm thinking we're going to talk about some really, really important stuff for the next hour. And what we, ta we talked about for the next first hour of this big meeting at Disney was, do we put sound effects in for the farts? <laughs> or do we do it without sound? And literally, Jeffrey Katzenberg, most clean guy in the business, is like, well, if you have the sound effects, it kind of takes away. And I'm thinking, this is what Hollywood's done. We've got fart sound effects for hours. It's really bizarre, but... <laughs> No, uh, because I get people come up to me and they're like, "Oh yeah, you're the guy who farted in Camp Iron Love." Dude, that was awesome. They're like, they're like, the sound it made. It was like, and they're making fart sounds all the time. I'm like, nah, no. I'll tell you, he didn't even make the sound. Make fart noise. But you, really, really, I'll tell you honestly, <laughs> the one in the car. It was he, unfortunately, did really not have that kind of skill. <laughs> For real. So. We smell the stuff. <laughs> Anything? By the way, we, we invited Patrick. He was um, out of town. He's washing his hair. Great guy. <laughs> out of country. Uh, Seth Green, you saw, wanted to make it, but he couldn't yes. be here. I wanted to say, uh, when I went to shoot that video of Seth, the first thing he said was, I remember skateboarding with Max Perlin. Um, and he talked about uh, he talked about the whole cast and uh, you know I guess he was a kid then but yeah. talked really fondly about all you guys. He was 24 then. <laughs> <laughs> like Billy Clark. He was like a 13 year old kid, but he said being around you guys, you guys were having all the fun, and he was like the kid. Yeah, you know? well, he, was he could fun. hang out with us as much as he wanted to, but um, he um, he really had a good time, I think, as well. Amanda, we could not find. I I spoke to her two days ago. And Whoa. Yeah. Did she, get the mic? Really? The mic. I, I opened up my old, old, old address book and called the four numbers and reached her mother. And um, I was Amanda's guardian when she was under 18 and she was coming to California to go on auditions and stuff. She used to stay with me. So um, I talked to Sylvia and then I got to speak to Amanda. And she's got a little girl and she could not get away because she's going to school right now. It's just kind of last minute, unfortunately. We'll give our best to What, to what about Tina? Amanda's going to Tina, what about Tina? Oh, uh, Facebooked her. She didn't write me back. <laughs> Tina? Oh. Yeah. And Devin, I spoke to. Her husband won't let her drive at night. Which I got. Her husband is a uh, soap opera guy. Ron then he's like the hunk of hunks. Ron Moss? Anybody know Ron Moss? No, no. <laughs> Some hunky guy in the soap opera. And she lives in Camarillo, and she said it was late. It's like three in the morning now. So I come on, get Devin. You know, Devin's cool. Devin's very cool. She's cool. And what about Great Beth, um, Miss Dolans? Miss Dolans. Who's Miss Dolans? Amy is moved to Canada, and she's actually flying in tomorrow. The daughter of one of the monkeys, Mickey Dolans. Dolans. Okay, yes. coolest part of the whole movie was becoming friends with Amy Dolans and having dinner cooked by Mickey Dolans <laughs> at his house, because the monkeys, I mean, come on, that for me was huge. Meet Mickey Dolans. Very cool. What about uh, Dennis Dugan? Oh, he's dreading Dennis Dugan has a premiere tonight, you could not make it. Dennis Dugan, who played Ronnie Miller's father. I loved him when he was Richie Brockelman. Does anybody remember when he was Richie Brockelman? Remember that? What was the name of that? It was a James <laughs> It was from the spit-off from the Rockford. So I wanted him to play. Dennis Dugan's become a huge Adam Sandler director. Yeah. He directs every one of Adam Sandler's movies, and they had an opening tonight with Jennifer Jennifer Aniston. Thanks. Uh -huh. Jennifer's every every movie. Um, anybody else? Uh, Thank you all for coming. Right. No, I would say just um, become a lawyer first. <laughs> become a lawyer first, and you read your contracts. You still get screwed. Like Jerry Henshaw, Mark Burton. Inspire, Mark. No, it's uh, just uh, just uh, write. You know, just uh, write. It's sort of writing what you know. You know, like I knew high school. I knew there was clicks in high school. It was the easy thing to write. You know, nerds, this, that. That was pretty easy to write. So. So did somebody rent you? Or did you rent somebody? 
I was rented. You were rented? Uh, <laughs> I'm still under contract. $50. <laughs> By the way, when I, I, Amanda and I worked uh, together again. I was doing Doogie Hauser and uh, I did an episode where there was a blind girl and we just, uh -huh. I went to Stephen Boschko and I said, let's not audition, we just bring Amanda in and he was a fan of hers and she came in and um, we, I got to see her again. It was like two years later, three years later. Well, Michael, I'd like to say on behalf of the rest of the cast assembled here, thank you for letting us be a part of your, your film. Well, let, yeah, thank uh, you. Thank you for taking B minus lines and making them A plus lines. You guys deliver the goods. <laughs> See you on this one. Can I ask uh, Big John to start us off with a very slow clap? <laughs> uh, you go first. You go no, first. To, to finish this up. I don't know when I had to do that. I, we hate it. Uh, no, because Gerardo, I had to do this slow clap. And for me, it was, I was like, I got to be really serious about this. And Gerardo <laughs> kept screwing around. He's like laughing and giggling before I have to do it. I'm like, Quit, dude, man, this is serious. <laughs> the Toronto just kept laughing, it was funny. Okay, I'll be. <laughs> Thanks for coming, guys. And thank you, guys.